Hello friends, I am Arpit and I am here with today's analysis. Today is 17th of June and we are going to deal with two very important topics which are in news. The first is Bonn Climate Meeting on Climate Change. Now what is it? As we know that every year the COP happens, Conference of Parties of UNFCCC. Last year it was COP28 held in Dubai. This year COP29 going to be conducted in Baku, Azerbaijan in November 2024. Now, in the midst of these COP meetings, there is a meeting which is conducted as a mid-year review and as a build-up or which will prepare the COP meeting of that year. That is what Bonn Climate Meeting is. The main issue for discussion in this year's Bonn Climate Meeting was climate finance because this year the countries have to adopt a new climate finance goal. But unfortunately, no such concrete outcome was there. There is always this debate between the developed and the developing on the climate finance. Unfortunately, nothing concrete happened this time. But let's see and be hopeful for Azerbaijan. So all eyes on Azerbaijan this year. Next is India at Peace Summit in Switzerland. So a peace summit was conducted in Switzerland. For what? For Russia-Ukraine war, which is you know, more than two years old now. Unfortunately, Russia was not invited even for this summit. India was invited. India's presence was also important and India's presence was uncertain. But India was present, represented by the Foreign Secretary West. What was India's stand? India actually did not endorse the outcome of this peace summit because India strictly believed that we cannot come to a sustainable resolution to the war without the participation of Russia. We are only endorsing Ukraine's viewpoint that is not going to bring peace. Along with India, other seven countries also took the same position. More than 80 countries you know, endorsed the outcome of this peace summit means they were in support of the peace summit. So let's see. And in the end, definitely we'll be looking into the MCQs and today onwards, I will be discussing the answers to those MCQs as well. Now, the Bonn climate meeting or the Bonn meeting on climate change, we can say. This happened in the city of Germany every year and this is also has become a regular affair that every year as a build up to the upcoming COP, this Bonn meeting happens. Last year also it was conducted in Bonn, the same place. This year also now it has been conducted in Bonn. But unfortunately, this time it failed to make much headway on the crucial issue of defining a new climate finance goal. Now, there is a climate finance goal presently. That climate finance goal is of $100 billion. This $100 billion climate finance goal was, I would say, adopted in 2009 in COP15, conducted in Copenhagen. And according to this $100 billion goal, which was adopted in 2009 in COP15, the developed countries had to give the developing and underdeveloped countries this much amount every year starting from 2020 onwards. So 2020 is just four years away or I would say ago from now. We are discussing a new climate code. Why? Because this $100 billion is not enough. Obviously, the developing and underdeveloped countries who receive this amount they claim that this is not enough, but fortunately, the developed world has also acknowledged this fact that this much amount is not enough. How much amount is enough according to the developed world? They have been silent on that. But yes, the developing world have been demanding at least $1 trillion per year. There's a report also released by UNFCCC, which clearly states that from now till 2030, that is six years roughly, six trillion dollars are required if we have to meet the climate goals if we have to stop global warming and this amount has to come from the developed world because historically they are responsible for climate change or global warming so this is what it is by the end of 2024 countries have to finalize a new sum of money above the existing figure of 100 billion dollar per year so by this year end they have to finalize that what is going to be that new climate finance goal and that new climate finance goal is termed as new climate quantified goal. N C Q G. 
I can say that this NCQG is going to replace this $100 billion code. So it has to be adopted in COP29, which is going to be conducted in Baku, Azerbaijan this year. But unfortunately, nothing on this happened on the bond climate meeting. What is the bond meeting all about? Every year, the members of UNFCCC meet in a mid-year review meeting and set up the agenda for the upcoming UNFCCC COP of that year. So COP of this year is in Baku, Azerbaijan. It is COP 29, November 2024. It is going to be scheduled. So it is this bond meeting of this year was kind of a build up to the COP 29 in Baku. What was expected from bond 2024? Actually, one thing which was expected was the new climate finance goal or the NCQG. A consensus on that should be adopted or reached at least. The bond talks and annual fixture in June were expected to give at least some indicative numbers. Ki bhai, $1 trillion or half a trillion dollar, $1.5 trillion, at least some indicative numbers should have been given, but unfortunately, nothing was given. They could have been worked upon before COP29, where they have to be finalized, but nothing of that sort was given. What was given was an input paper, a 35 page, 428 paragraph input paper was released. This input paper was broad description of the wish lists of different countries, not just a quantum of climate finance, this 35 pages in detail, but also other issues associated such, such like who should be contributing, what should this money be spent on and how the finance flows should be monitored. All these are good that these, these things were there, but how much money should be coming, this did not happen. So. This paper was kind of a broad description of the wish list of the countries. The paper is likely to be developed into a formal negotiating draft that can be agreed upon in COP29 because this paper had some good provisions like who should be contributing, what should this money be spent on and how the finance flows should be monitored. So it will be adopted as a formal negotiating paper but with one addition that is the amount, what amount has to come from the developed to the developing country. What is the money needed for actually? Money is needed for multiple things. In a nutshell, we can call them climate action. It, it, it is needed not just for facilitating mitigation or adaptation works. Mitigation works means you are reducing the carbon emissions. So let's suppose you want to, uh, you, you are making a very big solar park in your country. So solar park obviously entails some costs. You'll install solar panel panels first, you'll acquire land, then you'll install solar panels on it. Then the solar panels will generate electricity. You will store those electricity, generated electric, electricity by the solar panels in the batteries. So cost is there. And this will reduce the carbon emission. That is why it is a mitigation strategy. Adaptation in which you adapt yourself. Like you are building climate resilient disaster uh, infrastructure or disaster resilient infrastructure, which due to climate change or global warming, are not impacted. So you are adapting yourself to climate change or global warming. That is also entailing cost. It requires cost. So various mitigation or adaptation works, mundane task of collecting and reporting climate data. This also entails cost and this has been mandated as per the COP21, that is the Paris Pact, which happened in 2015. From where did the money come and where will it go? Under the international climate architecture set up by the UNFCCC, Rich and developed countries are obliged to provide money to developing countries to fight climate change. Why so? Because there is this historical emissions done by these developed countries, so called. They did those emissions way back in or during the Industrial Revolution. And global warming of climate change, which we see today, is happening because of that. The developing countries of today contributed negligibly in those emissions. That is why. The receivers are the developing countries of today and the donors are the developed countries of today. How much money has to be mobilized? In 2009, developed countries promised to mobilize $100 billion every year from 2020 onwards for this purpose. And this was not a negotiated, I would say, amount. The US Secretary of State at that time declared $100 billion. So everyone agreed to $100 billion. No negotiations, no scientific, I would say, findings behind this particular 
I would say about hundred million dollars, which is obviously less. Has it been mobilized till now from 2020 onwards? Yes. A few weeks ago, there was a report by OECD, that is Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, a grouping of the rich countries. Obviously, they will say that it has been mobilized. So they claimed that 100 billion target had been met for the first time in 2022. They were at least this much honest enough that this target was not met in 2020-21. It was met for the first time in 2022. But what do the developing countries say about it? Was it actually met? See, the developing countries contest these claims of OECD, citing double accounting, double counting and innovative accounting. So they say that this is basically actually not on the ground due to innovative accounting methods or by double counting, it is $100 billion complete. So in effect or in actuality, it has not come. So both of these blocks, we can say, are differing over here. How much money is needed? It is widely acknowledged that the developing countries now need trillions of dollars, not billions annually. A UNFCCC assessment last year said that six trillion dollars between now and 2030, since it came last year, so now means 2023 and 2030, just to implement their promised climate actions. Only for their adaptation needs, some of which are part of their climate actions also, developing countries require 215 billion dollars to 387 billion dollars only for adaptation purposes. For global transition to clean energy, this is mitigation. Clean energy is renewable energy and all. So presently, the countries are using more and more fossil based fuels. And from fossil based fuels, they are transitioning to clean energy. So that transition is what is called as global transition to clean energy, not just in developing countries, but in overall the world. 4.3 trillion dollars every year till 2030 is required and about 5 trillion dollars annually after that till 2050 is required if we have to achieve net zero. Net zero is whatever we are emitting, we are taking in that much. These are assessments of a few specific needs. The overall requirement for climate finance is much greater. So this is what it is. What are the developing countries demanding? A few months back, India formally proposed that developed countries should commit themselves to providing at least $1 trillion every year. The Arab countries have said this figure should be at least $1.1 trillion every year. African countries have demanded $1.3 trillion every year. What has been the response of developed world? The developed world has not made any offer publicly. They have just acknowledged that the new amount has to be higher than the $100 billion per year. This is some good news. Hello, this acknowledgement is there at least. So, this is what the scenario is. Now, the debate over responsibility. Who is responsible? According to UNFCCC and Paris Agreement, only the countries listed in Annex 2 of UNFCCC, these are the developed countries listed in Annex 2, 25 of them and the European Economic Community are responsible for providing climate finance to developing countries. The listed countries, however, have been trying to shift the responsibility to others as well. Who are these others? These others are those countries which were not so developed or they were not, their economy was not so big when this list of annexure 2 was prepared in the 1990s. Actually, this was prepared in 1997 when Kyoto Protocol came. Kyoto Protocol was conducted. So at that time, certain countries like China, South Korea, they were not so advanced, but now they are advanced. China is the second largest country. So these developed countries or these annexure two countries say that these countries should also be included in this list of 25 countries. Why are they not included? They argue that many other countries are now economically better off than in the early 1990s when the list was made. They also argue that the requirements are too high, too huge for the original group of listed countries to meet. So this is what annexure two countries are wanting to share. Let's see whether this happens or not. Which are these non annexure two countries? China, the world's second largest economy, oil rich Gulf countries, South Korea. These are not part of annexure two, but these are rich countries nowadays. So, the annexure two countries, which are the developed countries, they are wanting that these countries also be included over. In Bonn this year, China said that it was playing its part in the global fight against climate change but had no intention of taking additional responsibility. So it has made its 
intentions very clear. NCQG is the biggest thing on the climate change agenda this year. An agreement on this has to happen at COP29 because it was pledged by the leaders that before 2025, we have to adopt this NCQG. And this time, this climate finance goal is not going to be a unilateral goal announced by the US alone. It is properly negotiated. All the stakeholders, whether developed or developing countries, are part of it. And it is going to be more scientific, more data driven, and more legitimate, I would say. So just be hopeful and see how this how much this ncqg is going to be ncqg has to be adopted this is i could not say for sure but yes this is a pledge of all the countries which are part of unf c but yes how much will be the amount what are going to be the terms and conditions let's wait and watch and let's be hopeful as part of india next is india at the peace summit in switzerland now this peace summit was a two-day summit which had to be conducted we discussed about it earlier as well. Many heads of the states or the countries, they attended around, you know, one fourth of the heads of the states or countries uh, of the countries, they attended this summit. Who represented India? To represent India was the Foreign Secretary, Mr. Pavan Kapoor, Foreign Secretary West. He was attending this summit. He is the guy. And what has been India's stand? Basically, India refuses to endorse the Ukraine mean statement. There is a reason behind it. Reason is that this particular meeting did not invite Russia, who is the main, I would say, stakeholder, one of the main stakeholders apart from Ukraine, for whom this meeting is getting conducted. So it was obvious that only Ukraine's demands were met. Can in this way peace be achieved? Well, I don't think so. And this is the reason why India refused and only proposals acceptable to both Russia and Ukraine can lead to peace. This was the statement issued by India. India was among the seven countries which refused to endorse the outcome of the peace talks. On the other hand, 80 countries endorsed the outcome. Obviously, these are pro-West countries or those countries who are hardcore anti-Russia. Who did this? So, it is like this. Now, the points for consideration. So, there were three broad areas which were discussed and these were the points for consideration. First was nuclear safety. Nuclear safety not only included non-usage of nuclear weapons, but also non-usage of non-nuclear weapons in the vicinity of nuclear power plants because there is a threat of leakage. So, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which is Europe's largest, world's 10th largest, was at threat because you know a lot of shelling and bombing was going in and around it this is in ukraine but now under the control of russians global food security should be maintained because ukraine is one of the highest exporters of food grains in the world many countries depend upon the food grains coming from ukraine so that should be maintained and humanitarian issues they should be addressed like there are many prisoners of wars their their dignity should be maintained humanitarian aid should be you know, not stopped like it is stopped in the case of Israel and Gaza. So all these things were the main agendas for discussion in this particular meeting. On what basis was the joint communique built? The joint communique was built on Ukraine's peace formula and the UN Charter and resolutions. Ukraine's peace formula. It did not consider Russia. That is why India has rejected the outcome of this peace talks. It is not endorsing. What has been India's approach and viewpoint? India participated in the summit. Earlier, it was also skeptical or I would say not clear whether India will participate or not. Then, and endorsed that its participation and continued engagement with all stakeholders is to understand all perspectives, approaches and options to find a sustainable resolution to the conflict. So, India said that we are participating. We want to understand and better know the viewpoints, the, I would say, perspectives of all the stakeholders who are participating in this summit and this will help us build a better viewpoint on the issue as of now in india's view only those options which are acceptable to both parties that is russia and ukraine will lead to abiding peace else this kind of i would say summits are going to be gimmickal are going to be for the namesake only Unless and until you bring Russia on table, Russia on board, you know, peace is not going to happen. 
this is the wrong approach as per Intel. Now, standpoints of various other countries, countries that refuse to sign the community apart from India are Saudi Arabia, Thailand, South Africa, Indonesia, Mexico. Mexico is, I would say, a surprise entry over here because Mexico shares a very good relationship with USA, also is in the vicinity of USA, USA which endorses the outcome of this, uh, you know, meeting, peace meet, it is called the joint communique. But Mexico is rejected to endorse it. The UAE. What was China's standpoint? China was invited, but China declined the invitation. And this is one of the major concerning points for many countries in the world, which clearly highlights China's and Russia's growing friendship. In 2022, coincidentally, both these countries have announced a friendship without any boundaries or friendship without limits. So this is going to be, you know, a big threat to the West, especially. Was Russia invited? No, Russia was not invited. We've seen that. So this is the standpoint of various countries. The developed West all endorsed the joint communique. All were in favor of this communique because, you know, they are pro-Ukraine, anti-Russia. Now we enter into the MCQs. The first question is, COP29 is scheduled to be conducted in which city or country? The very simple question it is. Dubai UAE was COP28. Sharm al Sheikh was COP27. Egypt. Baku Azerbaijan or Astara Azerbaijan. So, in both these options, the country is similar Azerbaijan Azerbaijan, but you also need to know the city because the question is city slash country. So, you have to be this much specific because UPSC has become this much specific and demands such kind of specific information to you from you. So, the correct answer is Baku, Azerbaijan. Relatively very simple question it was. Second is, consider the statements and mark the correct one. First is, new collective quantified goal is about keeping the global temperatures within the 1.5 degree Celsius limit by 2100. Second statement is, in COP15, which was held in 2009, it was mandated for the annexure to countries, means the developed countries, to provide $100 billion funds to the developing countries every year starting from 2010. That is the very next year from COP15. Now, which among these statements is are true? We have to find that. The new collective quantified goal is not that goal which is mentioned over here, which is keeping the global temperatures within the 1.5 degree Celsius limit by 2100. This is a separate goal. NCQG, a new collective quantified goal, is all about climate finance. It's all about finance. So, first statement is wrong. Second statement, very catchy it is. This part of the statements in COP 15 2009, this is correct. It was mandated for the annexure to countries to provide 100 billion USD funds to the developing countries every year. This much portion of the statement is correct, but this portion is wrong. Starting from 2010, it is actually starting from 2020. So, don't get swayed away by reading this much statement only. Achha, this is correct. And if you forget to read the later or the end half or the end portion of the statement, you'll mark it wrong. So this statement is also wrong. The correct answer is D for this. Both the statements are wrong. Third, for how many of the following purposes is the climate fund required by the developing countries? So the word is, keyword is how many first of all. First is for gathering climate related data. For installing renewable energy projects, for constructing climate resilient infrastructure. Now, in our notes, we read that gathering data, which was mandated as per COP21, for that funds are required. So, this is correct. So, one at least is correct. For installing renewable energy projects, these are mitigation strategies because from renewable energy, you know, you will be emitting less carbon. So, this is also correct. For constructing climate resilient infrastructure, this is adaptation. This is also correct. Both these were discussed by me. This was explicitly mentioned in the notes. So all the three are correct. So correct answer would be for all the purposes mentioned over here, climate finance is required by the developing countries from the annexure to countries or the developed countries. Fourth question, which among the following was the agenda of the recently concluded peace talks with respect to Russia, Ukraine war in Switzerland? First is nuclear safety. As I already discussed, this is correct. Global food security, since Ukraine is 
a food exporter to many countries for uh, food grains of uh, exported to many countries so both of these options are correct so this is the correct answer for this particular question very easy straightforward question it was and the last question which of the following countries have refused to sign the communique issued post the peace talks in Switzerland in June 2024 means there were total seven countries India was one among them so first India is right so you will see India in all the options or unfortunately you cannot eliminate it Germany Germany is a western country or I would say a pro west country so probably applying common sense it will not be there UAE it is a big question but yes UAE was among those seven countries Mexico there might be possibility that someone some some of you might think that Mexico is pro USA or uh, I would say an ally of USA so it might be endorsing the uh, you know joint communique but as I mentioned in the video earlier that it is a surprise that Mexico is not endorsing this joint communique so Mexico is also one among those countries UK is again pro West pro USA it is not endorsed it so one three and four is going to be the correct answer for this particular question and with this we come to an end of today's session I will be seeing you tomorrow now with more such informative news pieces till then you guys very well know what to do keep studying keep reading keep writing and most importantly keep revising namaste jai